Now, I'm a neurologist, medical doctor, and I've been in practice doing this type of procedure since the early 1990s. So suffice it to say, I've probably done thousands of these procedures. And I do call them spinal fluid examinations or lumbar punctures. In the language that I speak as a neurologist, I don't tend to use the term spinal tap, although some people still utilize that term. I think part of the reason is besides the terms that I use being more medically accurate, the term spinal tap sort of has a connotation that brings a lot of fear and worry to folks. And so I just avoid that term altogether. This is a very routine test. And in a nutshell, it's, it's performed to measure certain aspects of spinal fluid, whether that's the pressure that the spinal fluid is under or certain chemistries related to spinal fluid or whether or not there's infection or other what we call biomarkers, and I'll explain that in a minute, present in the spinal fluid. Essentially, the possibilities are pretty limitless, just like all the different blood tests that you can have done. Many of those tests can be done on spinal fluid, but sometimes the testing is more specific when spinal fluid is examined. Now, when, when I was taught to perform this test, I was told that at any given moment in time, there are about 140 cubic centimeters or milliliters of spinal fluid present within the spinal and skull cavity. This is a fluid that's produced at the center of, of the brain in a tissue called the choroid plexus. And uh, you can find big cavities full of spinal fluid in, in the two main areas of the brain called the lateral ventricles. But these, this spinal fluid is going to track down through channels um, and aqueducts in the brain, ultimately to bathe the spinal cord and the brain so that the spinal cord and brain essentially almost float inside the skull and the spinal fluid. Now this spinal fluid really is a tissue of the body. It is biologically active. And it turns out, for example, that in the arena of regenerative medicine and stem cell medicine, that spinal fluid actually communicates with stem cells that have started their journey from your bone marrow and found their way into the spinal fluid and activates those cells to express what are called neural elements. But I wanna go way upstream before all a discussion of all of that and just go over a, a spinal fluid examination and what we can learn from spinal fluid. Again, at any moment in time, you have about 140 milliliters of spinal fluid, which would be maybe about, um, you know, uh, one liter, which is uh, a thousand milliliters. So um, I think I'm getting that right, hopefully. Um, so you have about a tenth of a liter, uh, uh, roughly uh, more than a tenth, you know, 1.5, um, one at, uh, divide a thousand by 150 at any rate. Um, present and you're constantly making more. So the very small amount of fluid that's actually removed is gonna be replaced. Now we do tell our patients to arrive at the clinic well hydrated for this procedure. Um, being hydrated is always better if you're gonna have blood drawn, if you're gonna have spinal fluid drawn, it, it really makes the blood flow or the spinal fluid flow much easier uh, for your doctor or the person performing the procedure. So arrive hydrated and try to arrive relaxed. Really, I, I always tell my patients, this is only slightly more complicated than having blood drawn. And by and large, it's not any more uncomfortable. So the person arrives uh, to our clinic, we do not resort to fluoroscopy, which is kind of like live x-ray guidance 
to do the lumbar puncture really isn't necessary. I'm gonna lean over and grab a model and you'll have a better idea of what I'm talking about when I pick it up. So here is the human uh, little model of the human pelvic bone. And when you're laying on your side, which is what you're gonna do during the spinal fluid test, this is kind of the position uh, uh, of your hip bones. And what I'm gonna do is put my hand on the top of your hip bone, this is the iliac crest, and I'm gonna feel down and I can actually feel these little spinous processes and the space between the spinous process. And we call that the L45 inner space. And so um, to reassure you, the spinal cord is, has already ended. There is no possibility of piercing the spinal cord with a properly performed lumbar puncture. There are nerves that are descending down in that canal below the level of the spinal cord. They're called the cauda equina, but they kind of just move out of the way. And really in the worst case scenario, you might feel a little tickle, but again, we're gonna numb you up anyway. So it's just not gonna happen when this is performed properly. So again, you come into the clinic, you're well hydrated, you're relaxed, because this is gonna be a really easy procedure at Charlotte Health and Neurology. I'm gonna have you laying on your side. The nurse is on the other side of the exam table so you can see the nurse. She's gonna help you bring your knees up. Ultimately, you're gonna have your knees as tight against your chest as possible. Here you are kind of this way. Again, your knees are tight against your chest as possible. And I put my hands on that hip bone here. I'm gonna kind of come directly down and I'm gonna feel for that space between the bones that are gonna open up because you brought your knees up toward your chest. So that opens up this space. That's why we want your knees high up, okay? Because if your knees are low, then we can't get the needle through that space, but if the knees are high, it opens up that space and this is a really easy procedure. Okay, so I'm gonna put on some gloves. Initially, I just put on some clean gloves. This is a sterile procedure, but initially I'm just gonna put clean latex gloves on just like this. And again, you're laying on your side and, and we're talking a little bit because I like my patients. I want everybody to be relaxed, right? And I have a, a, a procedure table next to me where I have this tray. Now I actually just did a lumbar puncture. So I've got some tubes with spinal fluid that I'm gonna show you even. So the patient's laying on their side. I put my hand on the hip bone. I've decided exactly where I'm gonna be numbing up and then inserting the needle. And then I'm gonna use a iodine based solution called betadine to actually scrub your skin to remove the surface bacteria and minimize the likelihood of infection. Now, if you happen to be iodine sensitive, we can always use something called chloroprep, which is alcohol-based rather than iodine-based. But in either case, it's fine. We clean off the skin. We also use some sterile drapes to kind of frame out that area. So these are just paper towels, basically, that are sterile. I'm going to tuck one in uh, under you. I'm going to tuck one kind of in your pant. Uh, waist, which is pulled down maybe an inch or two. You're not going to be exposed really uh, for the procedure, but I want to have a nice square open spot where, where I'm going to do the procedure and everything else is covered by a sterile drape. I do have another drape kind of on top of you that has a little sticky on it so it can kind of drape over your the front towards your belly and everything's covered. So I've cleaned you up and the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to numb you up. And this is actually 1% uh, lidocaine um, and the kits, this, I call this a kit, comes with some syringes and I actually use a very small needle. You probably can't even see this, a 30 gauge needle. And I'm gonna numb up just a little area of skin, just, just underneath the skin, we call it a bleb. So it's just a subcutaneous numbing. Honestly, that's probably the part that hurts the most and it's pretty minimal, right? So I've just numbed up the surface of the skin and then I'm gonna take a little bit bigger syringe. So here's a little bigger syringe. I'm gonna 
fill that syringe with lidocaine. See, I'm gonna go all the way up to the top, right? And then with my hand on your back, what I'm gonna do is very slowly infiltrate that area that the spinal needle is gonna go into very slowly with lidocaine, right? So you're gonna feel some pressure, pressure, pressure. If I need to get some more lidocaine, I take the needle out, get a little more lidocaine, I go back in. And again, I we carry plenty of lidocaine in the clinic. My nurse always has a bottle in her pocket. So I'm gonna make sure that you are completely numbed up. You're not gonna feel this, okay? This is no big deal. And the second time I put that needle in, you're already numbed up. So I'm just gonna go a little bit deeper, right? So numb, 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 numb. Maybe I put about three to five, no more than five, but generally like three milliliters at the most. It's a very, very small amount of lidocaine, but it's plenty to numb you up. So now we've got you all numbed up. And then I'm gonna, um, and by the way, I put sterile gloves on at this point, not just my clean gloves, I've got sterile gloves on, right? Because um, this whole tray is sterile. Um, and so we wanna be super clean. So I'm numbed you up. And then I'm gonna give it a couple minutes to, for that numbing medicine to really fully kick in. So I have these tubes. This is where the spinal fluid is collected. And I'm just opening the tops of the tubes and I'm laying them out on my tray and we're chatting again. I'm gonna give it a little time for the lidocaine to fully kick in. And I'm also telling my nurse, okay, make sure he or she has, you know, let's say your name happens to be Jane. Make sure Jane's knees are as you know, close to her chest as she can make them. And ladies generally are a little more flexible than the guys, but either way, we're gonna work with you, okay? All right, so you're numbed up and your knees are up by your chest. So you're really not gonna feel anything more. We're gonna go back to about that L45 or L34 inner space. And then I'm gonna insert a needle, okay? And here is a spinal fluid needle. Now I know it looks long and, and, but sometimes we only generally have to be about, you know, about halfway in. And again, you're not gonna feel this, okay? You're not feeling it. So we're just having a nice conversation. How was your weekend? Wasn't it beautiful this weekend? What did you do? That kind of thing. How's your grandkids, right? Okay, so I'm inserting the needle, inserting the needle, inserting the needle. And generally, because I'm very experienced at this, I can kind of feel that I'm in the right place, right? There's not a lot of guesswork involved. Okay, so I'm in the right place. And then look what happens. I take the center part out of this needle and guess what? Spinal fluid starts coming out. Now spinal fluid, I'm gonna cut to the chase, healthy spinal fluid looks clear. The only time this is gonna look yellow or bloody is two situations. Okay, we're not gonna see yellow spinal fluid in my clinic because that's like some of you has acute spinal meningitis and that's a medical emergency. We don't do lumbar punctures in the clinic for that kind of medical emergency. That's an emergency room hospital situation, okay? Now, if somebody has a lot of blood in their spinal fluid, one of two things has happened. If they had something called a, a, an arachnoid hemorrhage or a, a, if an aneurysm burst, again, that's a medical emergency. It is a very serious problem. People present with what they call the worst headache of their life. And um, you never ever see that in the neurology clinic. You see that in the emergency room or the hospital, okay? Now, we are going through tissue, your tissues, right? And occasionally, we'll get a little bit of blood in the spinal fluid, a little pink tinge, and that's not unusual. In my hands, most of the time that does not happen, um, but it's not unusual and that quickly clears. Um, and we'll always know that that was just a little bit of what we call a, a traumatic tap. It's not dangerous. In fact, it's sometimes actually sort of helpful, um, but um, it's no problem. And usually we don't even have that. Okay, so what's happened? So the needle is in there. I pull that little center stylet out and the spinal fluid is flowing. Now I might be interested in the pressure of the spinal fluid. So I'm actually gonna stick this in on the end of the needle 
And then there's actually a little stop cock. And so I'm gonna kind of put it together, I'll show you. And I'm not gonna do the whole thing here, but you'll get a pretty good idea. Okay, and this fits on um, the stop cock. Let's see, nope, wrong piece, there you go. Okay, so this actually has inches, I'm sorry, centimeters on it. And um, I am able to measure what we call the opening pressure of the spinal fluid. So there are some times when that's gonna be really important. Um, we especially see young to middle-aged women, uh, can occur in guys, but more often in women um, who have a condition called pseudotumor cerebri or idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And that's a condition where they overproduce spinal fluid and there's opening pressure is higher than it should be. And that's bad because it can put pressure on the nerves that connect your eyeballs, to your brain, your optic nerves, and actually can cause vision loss. So in the, in the cases where we're suspecting elevated pressure, we can measure that pressure. Normal pressure is like 12 to 21, 22 centimeters of water. I always say 22 to 25 is kind of a gray area. We start to get in the 26 and above, and believe me, I've seen it. That's elevated pressure, and we need to lower the pressure. And we can do that a couple of ways. We'll take off extra spinal fluid, uh, and then we put them on medicine to help lower the pressure, and there's even things we can do beyond that. But that's a little digression. So then we're gonna collect some spinal fluid. So here's a tube with spinal fluid. Who, how many people watching this video thought that spinal fluid would look like blood or look yellow or look, you know, um, kind of like pus material or something like that? Let's hope it does not look like that. It looks like water, folks. Spinal fluid looks like water. So here is a person that I evaluated for Alzheimer's disease. And that's a really big thing I wanna talk with you about today. Um, and I've collected five tubes of fluid. Now they're not completely full. So altogether I have two, four, uh, another three, that's seven, uh, eight, 10, 10 cc's of spinal fluid. Don't forget, again, person has 140 cc's of spinal fluid. We're just getting a small amount of spinal fluid and they're gonna probably within a few hours they've replaced the spinal fluid that we drew off. So this is not a big deal at all. Right, so this is gonna be tested for some different things. There's some things we always test for. I'm gonna look at the white blood cells, which are your immune system cells, red blood cells, which of course come from your blood vessels. We shouldn't see too many red blood cells, but as a general rule of thumb, for every one white blood cell, there can be up to 10,000 red blood cells. So remember I said, if I occasionally get a little blood in the spinal fluid, I'll know if that is just from trauma or there's perhaps something going on that you have a huge number of white blood cells relative to the number of red cells that suggests that we've got an inflammatory process going on, right? Um, now occasionally I see this, but even in multiple sclerosis, which is another very common reason to do a spinal fluid test, we don't see generally that many white blood cells. If a person with MS has a ton of white blood cells in their spinal fluid, they don't have MS. They have something else going on. So I'm looking at the cells. I'm looking at the protein level and glucose. That's especially important when you have a bacterial infection, for example. Bacteria like to gobble up the glucose or sugar. And so low sugars are seen in bacterial infections. Again, that's going to be meningitis. And by large, we don't see that in the neurology clinic. Uh, protein can be high in some cases of infection, uh, some inflammatory disorders, and even in some neurodegenerative disorders like ALS, where the findings will be nonspecific, meaning you can't make a diagnosis of Lou Gehrig's disease from spinal fluid, but if you do have elevated protein, that is a supportive finding. I then reserve one tube for microbiology. So I'm gonna look for bacteria, including the TB bacteria, we call mycobacteria. And then I'm also gonna look for fungus, okay? So the pathologists who receive the spinal fluid, they're gonna be doing stains uh, and look at the fluid under the microscope, but then they're also gonna be doing some culturing of that spinal fluid. And again, usually in the outpatient neurology clinic, 
we don't see any of that. That's not the main reason we're doing spinal fluid testing in outpatient neurology. Inpatient, yes. And by the way, if we need to test the spinal fluid for Lyme disease, we can also do that. Many things we can test for, right? Okay, now, Alzheimer's disease and MS. We need a fourth and a fifth tube. In MS, we're testing for immune globulins that are in your spinal fluid that are present in a disproportion to immune globulins that we see in the blood. And those are called oligoclonal bands. There are other tests that can be done on the spinal fluid for MS, like myelin basic protein, but actually a lot of these tests have kind of gone by the wayside. If you go over the 2017 revised McDonald criteria for multiple sclerosis, you'll find that the main biomarker at this time that is used commercially are oligoclonal bands. So to do that, we need your spinal fluid and we need a little tube of blood because again, we're comparing these immune globulins in your spinal fluid with your immune globulins in your blood. Alzheimer's disease. In Alzheimer's disease, this is really a condition where we've had the most advancements in what are called biomarkers. And these are changes that we can identify in the fluid that are specific for a given disease. Now, um, there is a protein called amyloid protein or beta amyloid 42 that is very common in Alzheimer's disease. It's actually, in a sense, an inflammatory marker. So anytime uh, you might have some inflammatory threat to your brain and to your body, amyloid levels can go up. Uh, they can go up even if you're sleep deprived, for example. Uh, but they tend to go up and then when you catch up on your sleep, they'll go back down. In the case of Alzheimer's disease, this amyloid forms an insoluble protein that builds up higher and higher and higher. And eventually you also start breaking down the nerve cells themselves. And as those nerve cells break down, there's the release of a protein called tau, T-A-U, that's made from the uh, transport um, machinery of the nerve cell that takes um, stuff, I'll just put it that way, from the nerve cell body down to the far end of the cell called the axon. That's called a microtubule assembly. It may be a little too sciencey for you guys, but tau, T-A-U, is another protein found in the spinal fluid or found in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease, and we can measure it in the spinal fluid, and this actually represents nerve cell injury. So when we're looking to do a spinal fluid test on someone with memory loss that's progressive, who we think could be evolving early Alzheimer's disease. And by the way, the changes that occur in the brain that become Alzheimer's disease have their start 10 to 20 years before the onset of symptoms related to Alzheimer's disease. So we can actually make the diagnosis of early evolving Alzheimer's disease in the preclinical state before the person ever has memory loss, right? Before they have memory loss. So we can say that they have the biochemical changes in the spinal fluid. And that's really important because we are going to be seeing in the next three or four months potentially, and then over the next few years, a variety of treatments that are aimed in particular at both the preclinical state, meaning before your symptoms show up, or the early state before things get really bad, okay? We want to catch people early, and this includes a compound that's being developed by Biogen Corporation called aducanumab. Lilly has one in the pipeline as well. I'm sure there will be others, uh, but these are the two uh, most advanced in terms of the research and closest to becoming commercially available especially the Biogen product. So we want to identify the changes before they really become a problem. Because again, if you think about that tau protein, that's nerve cell destruction and no one wants nerve cell destruction. So we want to know, you know, before the house starts 
to burn to the ground is it's Alzheimer's disease and we can stop it. It's like calling in the fire department, put out a little fire rather than, you know, put out the, the final cinders of a house that's actually burned completely to the ground. So we don't want that, right? So what we do for Alzheimer's disease is we actually get five tubes. The kid actually comes with four tubes, but we get a fifth tube. And there's a couple of reasons for that. On tube number four that comes in the kit, we're going to measure something called your amyloid beta 42 to 40 ratio. And the 42 to 40 ratio is this amyloid protein that's different amino acid lengths. Amino acids make up this protein called amyloid protein. They're the building blocks of this protein, right? And it turns out that some amyloid is 40 amino acids long and some is 42. But the amyloid beta 42 is the one that's associated with Alzheimer's disease. So we can measure the amount of 40 and 42, and the lab will calculate for us what's called the 42 to 40 ratio. And the lower your 42 to 40 ratio, the greater the probability of developing Alzheimer's disease. Now notice I said probability. I didn't say you have Alzheimer's disease yet, right? So this measures risk and that's good, but it's not specific enough. So with tube five that comes from a commercial lab has a little different makeup to the tube. It looks like this. You wouldn't know it was different. We know it's different. We're going to draw an extra tube with a couple of cc's of spinal fluid. And we're going to be able to send that to a lab that's going to measure tau protein, total tau, what's called phosphorylated tau and amyloid levels. And they're gonna create a graph for us using a calculation called the amyloid tau index. And they're gonna plot that on a graph against the amount of phosphorylated tau. And if your result on this graph falls above a certain cutoff point, that tells us that the findings are consistent with Alzheimer's disease, okay? So what I've done today is I've walked you through the basic procedure. In my office, we're talking 10 minutes, maybe 10, 15 minutes at the most. Painless procedure, which they collect the fluid, the needle is removed, no bleeding by and large or minimal bleeding. Sorry, I lost my voice a little bit. Minimal bleeding. And you're gonna straighten your legs. We're gonna kind of massage the area a little bit. I'm gonna remove those sterile drapes. My nurse is gonna come around. She's gonna put a Band-Aid on your back. That is how much you need, just a Band-Aid. I'm gonna cough, excuse me. <clears throat> I am just getting over a cold. So we did this procedure for you. We're gonna tell you to hydrate, rest up, kick back on the sofa today, catch up on Netflix or your favorite binge program or the movies you wanted to see. We don't want you lifting, bearing down, et cetera, hydrate, hydrate well. And nine out of 10 people, no problem whatsoever. Now I'm gonna close with this. There are a very small percentage of people who develop something called a post lumbar puncture headache or post LP headache. These are not fun. They are not dangerous. They feel bad, but they are not dangerous and they are treatable. And the way you would know if you had a post LP headache is that you're okay when you're laying down, but when you stand up, you get this pounding headache because it's, it's essentially a low pressure headache and the brain settles down and there's some stretching of that meningeal layer around the brain. So initially this can be treated with caffeine. I recently uh, did have that uh, occur with one of my patients. I called in a medicine that's known as Caffergot, has a little ergotamine type medicine in it. That was very helpful. Um, but a lot of people end up getting a procedure called a blood patch. Now here at Charlotte Health and Neurology, we'd like to help you not have to go to the emergency room for a blood patch. So in those rare infrequent instances where you have a post-LP headache, 
we can send you to a local clinic that we work with on a regular basis and they have a fluoroscope, they have an anesthesiologist on staff, they draw a little blood out of your arm, they inject it into that space where you had the lumbar puncture and the headache is instantaneously gone, okay? So I wanna reassure you that this is uncommon, that aside from a post-LP headache, I never have a problem with a lumbar puncture. I've never seen significant bleeding. No one has ever died. There, no one has ever paralyzed. If you've heard this, I'm gonna tell you is wrong. It is wrong information. These are easy procedures that we do in the clinic every day, every day, or almost every day, very frequently. I've done thousands of them. They go well, they're super easy. I don't want you to worry. So if you need a lumbar puncture, if you're worried about MS, if you're worried about elevated spinal fluid pressure, if you're worried that you might be evolving Alzheimer's disease or your doctor is, I want you to come to me. We're gonna take care of you. You don't need x-ray guidance. That's super expensive. It exposes you to unnecessary x-ray, you know, x-rays with radiation. Um, come to me, we're gonna take care of you. I hope that was super helpful. Can I wanna reassure you, this is very easy. It's a relatively inexpensive test. It's covered by insurance. Um, so if you need the procedure, you're definitely in good hands. So wonderful to visit with you today. Let me know if you have any questions. I'll sign off now.